furious driving, proud to be supported by Diamond Bright, protecting, cleaning and caring for the furious fleet and for yours with 10% off using code FD10. Bidding Classics, the online classic car marketplace with more cars added every week. And Lancaster Insurance cover the furious fleet. They are one of the biggest specialist insurers in the UK covering all areas of vintage to modern classic cars and motorbikes. Follow the links in the description below. Welcome to Furious Driving, the home of poor financial automotive decisions and where the motto is usually broken rovers and shattered dreams. But today you might be looking at something which isn't a shattered dream or a bad decision. Because this is my 2003 Rover 75 1.8 Turbo, the best one to have in Oh, the best colour as well, Wedgwood Blue, which I picked up last week for £1,500 in exchange for the Fiat idea, but I think it's actually probably worth a fair bit more. So let's have a look around the car and find out what is wrong with this thing, because there are a few little niggles, but nothing too serious, I hope. We'll take the wheels off, get underneath it, and start finding out how good this car actually is and decide what we're going to do with it. Maybe we'll give it a clean-up as well. Now, starting at the front of the car, it's just all cosmetics. The car has been to a body shop about a year or two ago, where it had about £500 spent on it. I've not been down to the body shop to check what that was for, but I don't know if the bumpers maybe were retouched or the bonnet was touched in for stone chips or something. I don't really know. I'm going to go down and find out at some point very soon. So the bodywork is basically really good, but it does need a fantastic clean because where it's been parked up and not going anywhere for a while, there's green stuff growing in all the cracks. So that needs doing. And these headlights have yellowed quite badly, a bit like on the Beetle. We've still got most of the pack of ducks back left from when we did that, so I'll do that one. I'll do it in a minute, in fact, because that'll be an instant fix up and make the car look and feel better. Now, we are in a fairly rural area around here, and this side of the car has got quite a few little, very fine hairline scratches from bushes and trees and things where it's been driving down the country lanes and just caught this side. So, a bit of a polish on this side will bring us up a treat. Uh, secondly, on this side of the car, central locking, of course but not on this door. You have to pull that manually. Even the button in the middle doesn't work, so I'm gonna to have to figure out what's broken on that. Possibly the solenoid or whatever it is that pops the button up has gone pop. So we'll figure that one out interfrastically. Right, inside the car, things are pretty good to be perfectly honest. However, there's a couple of small things to deal with, which have actually already been unspoken to our good friend, your friend of mine, Paul from Project Nigel, to acquire a couple of extra bits. First of all, the right-hand indicator, it works and it stays on some of the time, but let me see that right now. It doesn't always pop on, so I've got myself a new indicator stalk so that I can indicate right without having, without having to keep my hand on the wheel. It tends to be just, if the wheel's in a certain position, it won't go on, so I guess the ratchety bit has just gone squiddly, so that will be switched into there. Secondly, the panel here on the door for the windows and the mirrors isn't quite right, so the electric mirrors do not do anything. Um, so, and the driver's window switch is very, very floppily doppily indeed. In fact, the other day I took it out in the rain, put the window down for something, couldn't wind it up again because the witch switch had gone just there. So that is another thing I have also acquired. So that will be going in, I might even do that in a minute. We'll start the process of fixing the car with this in a second, making it far more drivable. Uh, thirdly, there's a tiny, tiny crack in the plastic here. Someone, a viewer has very kindly offered me a new wooden trim. We're trying to work out how to get that down here because it's quite a big item and very fragile. So we're working on that, so that may happen. Fourthly, I think we're up to four, aren't we? Um, the steering wheel, it's pretty manky. A couple of people did watch the previous video and say, could it be cleaned? Uh, no, no it can't because if I give you a close-up, it's actually worn all the way through the leather on the back. I don't know if you're someone who's like a bit nervous and just sat there and stroked it all the time. So that needs to be replaced. But they do do a nice wooden option here, so we could do that. Fifthly, are we up to five? I think we might be up to five. It smells like it has been smoked in. Not strongly, not quite aggressively and unpleasantly like the Mercedes was. That wasn't really nice at all when that came back. But there is like a, a fine white dust in a lot of the crevices. So I wonder if that is like cigarette or possibly even pipe ash. Because it's got a slightly sweeter smell like a pipe would have. But need nonetheless. Uh, I need to give it a good clean up. I'm going to go and bissel the seats. And that brings us on to point number six. This headrest, which a few people saw in the video taken from the front of the car saying, what on earth is that? And I assume it's brill cream or something similar because it's an older gentleman and would have been using the old style kind of thicker, creamy stuff and it's just rubbed off on here. Again, the bristle is gonna come out and see if we can do anything about that because not nice. Um, okay, what else do we need to do? Engine bay, let's look under the engine bay. Now, fortunately, there is a very enthusiastic owner's community for these cars. Quite a strong community, in fact, considering it's such a new car. Okay, first thing, these struts, I should be writing this down really, shouldn't I? That I 
those struts need doing because that, if it's even slightly windy, does not stay up. We need to service this car. It's got a digital indicator on the, on the screen, so that will give us um, a countdown to when it's done. But I think it was about two years ago, so we definitely want an oil service. I've also got air filter and a cabin filter. So that will all be done. Secondly, the, there's a T-piece pipe, which is made of plastic and it cracks. Uh, it might even be why it had a gasket failure in the first place. Uh, M Discount MG Rover Supplies now do a metal version of that. And I'm just trying to work out where it actually lives see if it's been replaced already and if I need to change it or not um, and if I do need to change it I will it's only eight pounds but you do have to drain the uh, coolant system to do it so I'll find that must be in here somewhere I assume it's in here somewhere and, uh, <laughs> and then we'll get that changed out if necessary oh it's just here I think and that's still plastic so we will be changing that intrafrastically the other thing to mention while we're under the bonnet is of course the timing belt. This is something that came up quite a few times in the comments on the reveal video of this car. Now as I mentioned in that previous video this had a new head and head gasket in 2018. So not just the head gasket, the entire head was replaced which is a significant deal, cost the owner an absolute fortune. Prior to that it had had head bolts replaced so I'm guessing it was having some issues for a little time prior. But anyway on that receipt for that, I think it was £1,700 bill, there was no mention of a timing belt changed or a water pump. So I actually rang up the garage that did the job and said, would they have changed the timing belt or would they have reused the old one, given they didn't know how old it was at the time? And they said they would never, under any circumstances, reuse a timing belt. That's like their standard policy, don't reuse timing belts. So even if it's only a week old on the car, they'd have fitted a new one. For £20, it's not worth their liability of it failing a few days later. So they would not have changed it but they, they didn't know why it wasn't on the receipt but they knew they would not have put an old one back on again so this was 2018 it is tens of thousands of miles underneath the change point in terms of mileage it's got about another year to 18 months to go in terms of age so we're good the three things that normally scupper me on a new car are the timing belt is doing the tires are shot and more often than not there's rust and so far two out of three are good the fourth one is of course fuel pumps on cars that have been sitting but this one hasn't been sitting so amazingly we're doing well so far also under the bonnet the plenums i've been warned repeatedly about these drain holes down here left and right corners and also under here we'll check this middle one when we do the um, air filter the cabin filter those need to be rotted through to make sure they're not filled with gunk otherwise you both kill the ecu and rot out the sills so we'll do that one while we've got the bonnet up as well now i have to thank colin in ireland for this tip on this particular thing these plenum drains um, you rod them through he suggested a three millimeter welding rod now i haven't got any three millimeter welding rod but i have got ford crown victoria handbrake cable which is about four millimeters but ridiculously strong stuff so that can rod through you don't push too hard because it might make a hole in it and go, well it didn't go all the way to the bottom, it went a long way though. I can pour some water through to make sure that's looking good and we'll do the other one as well. This side is a little crustier on top, there's leaf mould and seed and that kind of stuff all run through. There you go, you can actually see the, uh, the wire poking all the way through this side. Excellent. Now I was going to save this for a fixing everything video but this makes the car a little bit unusable so I'm going to do it right now. There's a springy tags on the left and right of this that hold it in place so what you need to do apparently is just put a screwdriver under there a little tiny one and pry it up and then it should just come away there we go out it comes and unplug the two connectors there we go and that can go in the bin then reconnect the connectors Right, this is all hooked up now, and before I click it into place, though, I'm going to make sure everything works. First of all, electric windows, one touch on the way down. I'm going to assume those work as well, yeah. Yep, yeah, right, that rear one, a bit sticky actually. <laughs> windows are actually stuck. And then mirrors, left and right, the light comes on. Yeah, they move which is a big upgrade to actual function. I'll give this a clean up on the arm before I put it all back together again though. Butter being done, thing fixed. Oops, this is Diamond Bright interior cleaner, the stuff that absolutely rescued the interior of Quentin the convertible after that car was sat outside with the roof down for nearly a decade. That will bring up this armrest, a treat I am sure. 
yeah, look at that. Kind of brownness coming off there. Yeah. I will say a big thank you to Diamond Bright for their continued support of this channel because they make a big difference partly to the amount of stuff I actually get through um, in terms of cleaning these cars, but also their support, meaning we can actually do these projects, makes a huge, huge difference. And I am, I've got to say, a huge fan of the product anyway, so I wouldn't be using their stuff if I didn't like it. Cool. Much, much better. Super, and indeed, duper. And also, thanks to Project Nigel, Paul, who whacked that down to us over the weekend, ready to be fitted today. So, super extra thanks to him for that. Now, I am gonna break out the trolley jack in a minute to have a look underneath this car to find out what we're really dealing with. But also, while I'm in this door car, I've got a couple of oily spots. So, it's gonna quickly just gently touch them with some brake and clutch cleaner to lift those out of there. And unfortunately, it's a fairly whitish colored fabric, so that, and these are just basically oily fingerprints, probably from a garage visit at some point in its life. The mechanics climbed in with a glove still on or something like that. And this has obviously come unstuck from the back. That's really common on these. The only way to do that is to take the entire door card off, peel this back, take everything else off the furniture wise and glue it back on again. It's not a huge job in itself. It's just a lot of stuff to get to that point. Okay, next up on my list of things to do before I even get underneath the car, not because it's massively urgent, but just because it's a bit kind of icky and gross, is this headrest. Bissell to the ready, we're going to have a quick crack at that, because if I need to order a new one, they're on eBay between 20 and 50 pounds, depending on who you're buying from. So we'll have a quick crack at that, see if we can make it significantly nicer. Uh, it's not coming out. That's kind of what I wanted to know, is do I need to order a new one, or is this actually fixable? <clears throat> Although I am putting on layer after layer of the stuff, or oh, not later, soaking after soaking, it feels kind of brittle under the brush. Oh no, maybe it helps work it in a bit more. It's a nice warm day today, which helps. I will do these seats completely as well, but I want to take the car to Sainsbury's in a minute, so. Do you know what? I think we've pretty much saved this headrest. I was a bit unsure at first if it'll work or not. I reckon. That's actually done the trick. The substance I'm actually using, or the cleaning solution I'm using, is actually a Diamond Bright product, but it's one they've saved and only available commercially, like nursing homes and the like, for really heavy duty cleaning. It's not one you'll find on the website. Well, that kind of browny, milky soup froth, a terrible cappuccino, came out of purely that one headrest, so I think we've done a good job there. What a difference Abyssal makes. Also, I've noticed the boot badge has faded to nothing. A lot of early Nauties badges do seem to do this, but they're about 15 pounds on eBay, so one of those will have to be turning up soon. Right, let's dive in the boot, find our locking wheel nut remover. And I did find the other day in the cold, these boot struts were being blown back on me. I needed replacing, <clears throat> it smells a touch damp in here actually. Um, uh, have we got a locking wheel nut in here? Hmm, so I have actually got some water ingress in here, though it was raining incredibly hard over the weekend. I need to figure out where that's coming from. And next up we are going to pop the wheels off and have a look underneath the car as much as we possibly can with just on the jack. Now quite nicely it's got a big rubber jacking pad underneath there which makes jacking the car really easy. I have parked it in gear because the handbrake on this thing is shockingly bad. Um, I'm not going very high with it. Also there should be these little plastic covers that go over the, um, the locking wheel nut. I've only got two of them on the back. The front ones are both missing for some reason. This park side wheel nut thing is proving incredibly handy, again, and of course it's also had the advisory for stuff all over the uh, brake lines, so I want to have a quick look at that to see what they're like. Okay, starting off with the potentially rusty bit, a lot of dirt gathered up in there, but it does actually feel solid. There is surface rust on there, which 
looks like it's okay. So I will need to get in there toot sweet with my um, you know, built hammer or similar anti-rust stuff. But this is the point where it goes horribly wrong normally. And I've got to say, apart from surface rust, it does look like we're on a solid footing. Secondly, they break lines, which <laughs> I can't actually see where they go. I think that's them up the middle of the thing. From this distance, they look all right. I think they go up above the fuel tank and then you can't see them again. Rear disc, this is not a vented rear disc. That's unfortunate because Project Drive killed that in about 2001, I think, which is a shame. Um, would have been nice to have that. Got really good pads on there. Disc, a little bit of a lip on it, but it certainly got time. If you might catch a glimpse of a shadow just there, that's not a vented disc. That's just a bit of a groove in it. So we've got some mileage left in them. Plenty, quite, um, yeah, a bit rough, bit, bit grooved, but the pads look quite good. So we'll, we'll live the, with that a bit longer. Springs look all right. Big old meaty exhaust. Fuel pump looking easily accessible for once. I've got to drop an entire fuel tank to get that, which is quite a nice uh, thing. Yeah, it looks quite tidy this side. But yeah, it does need those arch liners coming out and an absolute ton of, uh, of wax oil or similar built hamber frost preventative wax paint goop stuff going in there. And this also at the same time needs to be addressed immediately because that's not a problem yet, but it's going to be before too long. It sills by the way also look really nice. If you've been following this channel for any length of time, you know this is the stuff where I tend to get burned quite frequently. <laughs> stuff which isn't really a problem for 99% of the population. Most of the cars I buy seem to have issues in this kind of area. Rust, broken stuff, tired fuel lines, tired brake lines, this kind of thing. But I think in this case, this car is just really good. Now this car did have a slight wibbliness in the steering every now and then when I was driving it over the weekend. However, when I went and checked the uh, tyre pressures after I'd driven it, I noticed the passenger side one was about 15 psi down, which probably explains it because there is absolutely no play in those wheels whatsoever. I think the receipt said one of these Dunlops is newer. I wonder if it's this one, because that does look like Good. Same again. Now you can't access anything behind here without taking these inner arches off, but the sills themselves do look really good. A bit cleaner at the front than it is at the back, curiously. More aluminium, I think, in used in these suspension parts. Bushes look okay. CV boots, then you can see that, that looks solid. It did pass the MOT a few weeks ago, so it should do. Bushes all look good. Brake pads, again, looking good. <sighs> Vented discs, but they're quite, quite ridged and there's a bit of a lip on them, so... I mean, they stop the car really well. It's just not as tidy as I would like. I think these were last changed about 10 years ago, according to the, uh, the receipts I've found. Flexi hoses look good. Here is that brake hose, the hard line. It's uh, a little bit fusty. And that uh, might be worth changing that at some point. I'm not going to panic at the moment though. I will start putting penetrating oil on those nuts and bolts though now. So when I do come to do it in a few weeks time or whenever, it's not going to put up a fight. And just side, again, more of the same, everything looking good. CV boot, flexi hoses. I've again doused this joint in a bit of bulldog in case I need to change it in the future. Um, the brake hard line, it's quite muddy, but that's basically all I can say about it, really. Everything else looks good. Uh, no sign of any play or damage anywhere. So generally, positive outcome. Oh, look, a little hatch, you can change the headlight bulbs. That's useful. Last corner, and it's the same story yet again. Slightly less surface rust on the edge of the wing or the sill panel itself. Under the car, the sill looks good. We need to get this cleaned and undersealed to the suite. Um, but otherwise, all looking good. Generally, I think we're up onto a winner with this car. Okay, so we've checked the car's physical health. Now let's check its mental health with the P-Scan. It's a car of a certain age, which means it's pre-OBD2, but it does have P-Scan. So we've got my Raspberry Pi set up here. Let's have a quick scan. So I've got the Rover 75 service indicator. I can click onto that. I can oil service reset. I can inspection reset, oil and time reset. 
I was retesting. Oh, okay. Lucky I'm changing the oil tomorrow. Uh, let's turn the ignition off and, and on again. And on. Inspection 15,000 miles. So we've reset the oil service light. Fantastic. It's got a setting specifically for the 75 and ZT with the V8 in it. That's interesting. Let's try a BD2 because it's quite a late car. Okay, so we're into the engine information. Getting error codes. Uh, two, two stored codes for a cylinder four misfire. Let's erase that. Erased okay. Zero error codes. If I turn the engine on now. If I jump start the car and turn the engine on now. So it has been cranking a little slowly, I guess because the car's been sat around for just so long. Um, that's run down. I'm not sure how old the batteries. I don't think it's particularly old, but dead batteries is a common feature of my cars, so it does fit in with the fleet perfectly. Here we go. We've got a setting under alarm and body. We've got a setting for Rover 75 and ZT. So let's see if that one works. Right. Okay. So we've got information about when the car was built. We've got the VIN number, um, error codes, driver window motor output fault, and passenger window motor output fault. I'm going to erase those codes and get them to reread because those switches were dicky. So erased error codes. Okay. Read again. No error codes. So I'm thinking the error codes on the body control for that were all to do with that bad switch panel. Excellent. Now I think we've got a pretty healthy car here. Apart from that one tra um, Apart from that one slight misfire it's picking up on cylinder four, which I wonder if it might be a bad spark plug or a bad um, HT lead. We are servicing it tomorrow. I hadn't included those in the service, but maybe I ought to as well. Anyway, right, I'm going to turn the engine off now and probably have to jump start it again in a second. So we now at least know the car is pretty decent. So I think we can probably give it a clean up now to say thank you for being a solid car. Let's get the hose pipe out. By the way, if you're looking for a P-Scan, you need to go to their website, pscan.co.uk, and we can pick one of these things up. Well, you can pick up the device itself, which is this small box just here, but sort yourself your own computer up. I've gone for a little Raspberry Pi, it's quite fun, and I didn't know what else to do. Right, so now, we know the car is mechanically and physically pretty solid. So the next stage is to get the thing looking clean. It's not particularly bad. It's just a little bit kind of faded. So I'm gonna snow foam it, wash it. And then once I've done that on a little bit of time lapse, then we'll jump in with some uh, cut and polish and get the thing looking shiny. Right, so that is a simple ceramic snow foam and ceramic shampoo and just a fibre off and the thing already looks fantastic. So much green goo came from behind all of these little bits of trim and that kind of stuff. And the bodywork is in fantastic condition. The next stage is going to be to cut and polish the entire car. But as I'm doing more or less daily videos at the moment, there isn't time today to do that. So I'll add that into the next video, which is going to be a complete service, changing the steering wheel and possibly getting into taking that door card off to figure out why that's not playing. But what I'm going to do to finish up today, though, is duck back these headlights because that will be a final incredible transformation going from this horrible clouded bleh look in just a couple of minutes to uh, crisp, shiny and clear. Right, so this does also need a complete under bonnet detailing as well. Uh, headlight cleaner just there. And we've got headlight clear, which is like a UV protective coat that goes on afterwards. We've got ourselves some cloths and that's basically it. So literally all we do is take our headlight cleaner I think I should have some gloves on for this, but, you know, I haven't. And polish it. And it's like taking, like, morning mist off a window pane. Look at that horrible surface gunk that's coming off there. What an instant transformation. cost of £12 off Amazon and bear in mind we've already done the uh, Beetle and the 200VI so three cars cuts this down to £4 per car we've saved a complete set of headlights for a third time incredible so you can see the side by side of that and that I mean seriously just look at the contrast that is under a minute's worth of work to get from seriously faded old plastic to that incredible new look. So that's headlight number two done. 
they go slightly misty as they dry off. But yeah, as soon as all four have dried, head like clear UV coating on there. And we have got ourselves a really sharp front face again. Look at that. Look how much dirt's come out of that one light. And it's only a little light. So now part two, headlight clear, which is literally a UV coating, a UV proof coating. So we wet the thing, Oop, don't lose on the floor, and coat the light in straight lines top to bottom. Simple as that. And it looks really nice and crystally again now. Give it five minutes, that will opaque off while it dries. But I do now see why I should have worn the gloves. I used them all up in the first two times I used the kit. Um, it does make your hands smell like molten plastic, which is not necessarily good. So there we have it. We now know that the 75 is as good as we had hoped. It's as solid underneath as predicted and mechanically and interior wise, it seems pretty decent as well. As far as YouTube goes, there's not a lot of stuff to fix. It's not some terrible rolling disaster that needs a thousand things fixing. Just a few little niggles to get it back up to perfection and a polish and a service and this thing is gonna be good to go. The question now is seriously, what do I do with it? Do I keep this because it is so nice? Do I sell it as I plan to all along, or do I keep this and move something else down the road? I mean, the two prime contenders to get moved on down the road in this case would probably be the Volvo because it's a very similar kind of thing. A big saloon with a non-folding back seat is kind of the same thing, although that one is a little older and a bit cheaper to tax. This one though is ULES friendly, which does kind of give it an edge. Or the Rover 400 Estate, because that's a great car, but it does need a lot of work in terms of paint, and that's an expensive fix. Maybe I should roll that one on down the line to someone else. I don't know. Toughy, eh? Anyway, right, thank you for watching. Next video you see on this car, we're gonna give it full service. We're gonna sort out that steering wheel, maybe that door card, who knows what we're gonna do. Anyway, thank you for watching. Like, subscribe, you know the drill. Links to the Ducks back stuff and all the Diamond Bright is down in the links below. You've been here before. Anyway, see you next time. Thank you for watching.